We're also um, this morning marking our annual Stewardship Sunday, so there's some financial information available there as well. This evening, we come to the end of a, a series in the Old Testament book of Ruth. Um, let me just say once more how deeply thankful we are to John, to John Rushton, um, for leading us through that book so helpfully and mining its treasures uh, so thoughtfully. Um, we're very, very thankful for that. Um, please do look up Ruth chapter 4. Last week, we saw godly Boaz take upon himself the redemption of the family line of the widow's Ruth and Naomi, and we saw him do that despite the considerable cost that it involved uh, for him. And we're going to pick up the story at Ruth 4, verse 13, and we'll read through to the end. Let's read and hear together. The word of God, Ruth 4, 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went in to her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer. And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Amen. Ruth is uh, the story. Well, good evening. And thank you for your welcome. And let me say it's been a privilege to be able to handle God's word with you these last few weeks. Our prayer, Lord, open our eyes to behold wonderful things out of your law. Amen. Well, we come to our final study in this book of Ruth. This book written about an event that happened during that 300 year period when the judges ruled, when everyone, or just about everyone, was doing what was right in his own eyes. And it's a story, a true story, that warms our hearts as it tells of two women and one man who were trusting in the Lord. So turn with me then to these last 10 verses of chapter 4. Now, most of you, I guess, have been with me, with us over the past five weeks um, and heard the story of Ruth. So let me ask you a question. Actually, David hinted at it earlier, uh, Andrew hinted earlier. Who is the main character in the book of Ruth? Well, it's Ruth, of course, isn't it? The book's named after her. And she's an amazing example of commitment to her mother-in-law and to the Lord. Remember those wonderful words in chapter 1, verse 16, but Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, for where you go, I will go, where you... Lord, I will, Lord, your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death puts me, parts me from you. And as Boaz said, 
He'd come to take refuge under God's wings. What an amazing example of devoted service as daily she went out and gleaned hard work and brought the grain back to her mother-in-law. What an amazing example of obedience as she did what her mother-in-law told her to do and went and asked Boaz to marry her. So much we can learn from Ruth. But perhaps Boaz is the main character, is he? Here's a man who believed in the Lord, the covenant God of Israel, who lived out in his daily work, his faith. Remember the way he treated his workers and the way he treated Ruth? Here's a man who saw the Lord at work in what happened that night at the threshing floor when Ruth asked him to marry her and fulfill his duty as kinsman redeemer. He saw God's kindness in what happened. Here's a man who went out of his way to do what was right and fulfill his duties when, when the nearer kinsman redeemer refused. Here's a man who is a, a wonderful pointer to the Lord Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. Yeah, a case can be made for Boaz being the main character. But I suggest tonight that an even stronger case can be made in having Naomi as the main character. It seems that the author, led by the Holy Spirit, because this is part of God's word, the author insists that we keep Naomi in view. Why do I say that? Well, it's apparent that in each major incident in this lovely story, the, the focus returns to Naomi. In chapter 1, well, the whole chapter is taken up with Naomi and her return to Bethlehem. But look how the chapter ends by focusing on Naomi and her friends at the town gate. The two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? And so on. In chapter 2, where the focus has been on Ruth and Boaz, again, look how the chapter ends with Naomi hearing Ruth's report, asking where she gleamed, being told the guy's name was Boaz, and Naomi's realization, ah, this man is a close, close, close relative of ours, one of our kinsmen redeemed. Naomi saw it as an indication that the Lord had not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And she takes charge, as it were, and tells Ruth to go with the, this man's girls. Chapter 3, following the thrill and suspense of the threshing floor, ends with Naomi conducting a debriefing session and telling Ruth to wait until she finds out what happened. And here in chapter 4, we see the same thing. Naomi comes to the fore again. Look at verse 13, where we read. We read that Boaz took Ruth and became his wife, gave birth to a son. And we'd expect the writer to go on and tell us about Ruth and Boaz, wouldn't we? But no, it's all, it's all about Naomi. Verse 14, the women said to Naomi. Verse 16, then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Verse 17, the women there said, a son has been born to Naomi. It's all about Naomi, isn't it? Each chapter returns to Naomi and some provision for her. In chapter 1, Ruth is the unseen provision. Chapter 2, it's that ephah of barley with the prospect of more, all that they'd need for the winter. In chapter 3, it's six measures of barley and the prospect of Boaz being their kinsman redeemer. And here in chapter 4, it's the provision of a son and heir. It's, just, it's as if the Lord is telling us, keep your eyes on Naomi. That's what I've been doing. Naomi's never 
been forgotten, she's always the focus of the Lord's attention. Look what her lady friends are saying in our passage in verse 14 and 15. See that? They, they exude praise for the Lord. So what Naomi now has, a kinsman redeemer, verse 15, and a child who, verse 16 says, shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. And they especially wax eloquent over what Naomi has had all along. Look, a daughter-in-law who loves you and is more to you than seven sons. They are praising the Lord and reminding Naomi for what Naomi now has and what she had all along. You see, Naomi is not empty. Remember what she said in chapter 1, verse 21, when she returned to Bethlehem? I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Well, maybe that's what it seems then, Naomi. But you're not empty now, are you? Naomi can now enjoy a bit of that joy that comes in the morning after a night of weeping. Psalm 30 speaks about it. For a great while, Naomi may even have despaired of mourning, let alone joy. But now, with a little help from her friends, she can see it. So let's learn from Naomi's story this evening. Even when we make mistakes, like Naomi and Elimelech have done, and like we all do, don't we? Even when we feel empty, maybe, maybe you're feeling empty tonight. Even when everything seems to go wrong. And I guess you've felt that way in Grace Church over the last couple of years, haven't you? Remember, the Lord can transform our situation as he did for Naomi. So let us, like Naomi, Keep on trusting the Lord and praying, looking to see the Lord's hand in what happens, and to keep on waiting for him. But Naomi isn't the real main character in the book, is she? Because this book is a book of the Bible. And as with all the books of the Bible, we can see and learn so much here about the Lord, the Lord himself. Not, not that the Lord speaks in the book, or not that the text says, this is what the Lord is like. But surely we can, we can see him, and we can learn what he's like, from what he allows and from what he does. And there are two things that I want us to notice about the Lord. Things that have been seen throughout the book, but things that are also mentioned in these closing verses. And the first, the first is the Lord's sovereignty. The sovereignty of God. For all that this is a, an ordinary story of ordinary people. God is so clearly involved. In God, indeed, God is clearly overruling all that happens. That's what I mean by his sovereignty. Well, we noted that in the first chapter, didn't we? When Naomi heard that the famine had passed back home in Bethlehem, she recognized it not as an upturn in the economy or an improvement in the weather, but as the Lord having come to the aid of his people by providing food for them. The Lord was in charge. Then, when Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem, they just 
happened to arrive as the barley harvest was beginning. And Ruth just happened to go and glean in the field belonging to Boaz, of all people. And Boaz himself just happened to arrive that day and noticed Ruth. Last week in chapter 4, we noted how the unnamed kinsman redeemer just happened to turn up at the right time. Now, these weren't coincidences, were they? God was in charge. As Paul puts it in Romans, we mentioned it last week, God was working, is working in all things for the good of those who love him. I hope that each each one of us is proving that in our day, today, in our lives, that the upsets, the tragedies, the joys, the seeming coincidences are all from God. He is in charge. He never causes his child a needless tear. He knows what he's doing. And in all things, all things, he is at work for the good of those who love him. You know, it may not seem like it at times. Far from it. We may, we may face illness, heartbreak, adverse circumstances, Everything might seem again to drive us to despair. But God is in control. God is at work. And often, looking back, you can see it. And when you can't see it, it's still true. God, who was in charge in the beginning of this story and in the development of this story, is in charge here at the end of the story in this chapter. God worked it out. God overruled so that the nearer relative couldn't or wouldn't redeem the land. And Boaz was able to marry Ruth. And then in tonight's passage, is that what we read in verse 13? The Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. In other words, God enabled Ruth to have a child. Now, it would have been so easy for the writer to say, and Ruth had a child. Well, that's what happens, usually, when a couple get married. But it's not as simple as that, is it? In the end of the day, it is the Lord who enables a woman to conceive. Conception is a gift from the Lord. Or sometimes, in his good purposes, he can't conceive. And that's of the Lord, too. Here, the writer is making a point that in all things, God is at work. It was God who gave them a son to continue the family name. It was God who caused such happiness and rejoicing in the town. It was God who completely reversed things for Naomi, as we've seen. At the beginning of the story, she experienced such bitterness and loss. And now, she's happily caring for her grandson. Beginning, she was empty. Now, she's full. It was God who brought Ruth, a friendless, penniless, childless stranger, to be one with the people of God. Wife of a gracious, caring husband. The center of an admiring community. The mother of a son. See, God proved that he was indeed the Almighty. The one day only had spoken about in chapter 1, who would transform both the situation. The situations of joy and blessing the reward of those who obediently and humbly take refuge under his vision. God showed that he was the Lord, the covenant God of his people.
But God's sovereignty, God's overruling, didn't just cover the past and the present, it extended to the future. The book ends with this list of names that came after Boaz and Ruth. And look at the last, the last name in the list. See it? Mentioned twice. David. That's that's David the giant killer. That's David the psalm writer. That's David the king. The greatest king Israel ever had. God was at work, all right. From these very ordinary people. One of them from pagan Moab. God was raising up a son who would be the grandfather of David the king. Four times in the in the book of Judges, we have the phrase, in those days there was no king in Israel. Now that's, that's not accidental. That's, that wasn't a careless repetition. In those days, the life of the nation was seen to be closely linked with the life of the king. People were expected to follow the king's example. And having no king, well, it meant that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Since they'd rejected the Lord as their king, they really needed someone, a leader, a king, after God's own heart. And unknown to them at the time, even in those dark days, God was preparing to give them such a king. He brought together a rich farmer in Bethlehem and a recently converted young woman from Moab, neither of whom were just living for themselves and doing their own thing. And as they lived under the shadow of his wing, trusting him, so he worked all things for their good and blessed them more abundantly than they could ever have imagined. And Ruth's son was the grandfather of the mighty David, the king after God's heart. Yes, it's an ordinary story, but God was in it. God was sovereign, working out his eternal purposes for the good of his people. And God is still sovereign. That's the second lesson for tonight. God is still sovereign. He's in charge of each of our lives and of our life together as a church. He has good purposes for us. So don't think that you're too insignificant. What could be more insignificant than a young woman from Moab, miles from home, gleaning barley just to get something to eat? What could be more ordinary than a widow thinking of her long-term future, a landowner going about his daily work, a nighttime conversation, the threshing floor. And it's right there in the insignificant, ordinary, that God was working out his purposes. And think of this. The explanation for much that takes place in our lives lies well beyond our own lives and may be hidden from us all through our lives. But God doesn't mean just to touch only our lives by what he does in us. He has the lives of others in view, even those yet unborn. See, that's why life can be so untidy for the people of God. He has not finished his business yet. There may be many loose ends. The tapestry is only partially complete. He is still, he has still much weaving to do in which he'll bring all those loose ends together. Perhaps in someone else's life, in the future, long after we are gone. God means to bring blessing and answers to prayer beyond anything we could ever imagine. Just as he did here. It's all in his wise purposes. Yes, God is still sovereign at work for the good of those who love him. The other thing about the Lord is the Lord's amazing kindness. That word kindness 
has come up every week in our studies. And it's a rich Bible word when used of the Lord's kindness refers to his covenant steadfast love and faithfulness. His love and faithfulness. In our prayer meeting in Cornerstone, we're going through the, the start the book of Psalms. And so many of the Psalms, so many of them, refer to God's love and faithfulness. God's love and faithfulness. Well, the word itself isn't used in our short passage tonight, but I think, I think it's displayed in verse 15, where it refers to Ruth's love for her mother-in-law. Her daughter-in-law. He says, who is more than to you than seven sons. And what a staggering statement that is in Jewish society. The whole story is a demonstration of the Lord's covenant love and faithfulness. Why do you deal with them in, in, in this way? Why do you deal with this family when the majority of people have turned their back on him? Because he loved them. He made a covenant with them. And he always keeps his promise. Back to those closing verses of chapter 4. To that genealogy. What a way to end a book, isn't it? But if you've never previously read those verses, you've probably seen them or heard them read elsewhere. Have you? In the opening chapters of the New Test chapter of the New Testament, Matthew chapter one, verses five and six, the same names appear. This time, not only as part of the family tree of King David, but this time as part of the family tree of King David's greater son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this, I suggest, is a great demonstration the Lord's amazing kindness, of his steadfast love in providing a saviour, and of his faithfulness in keeping his covenant promises. It's also, I suggest, the final explanation for and the purpose behind the trauma of Naomi's experience and Ruth's costly pilgrimage. What God was quarrying out of the suffering of these two women was nothing less than his purpose to bring his son into the world in Bethlehem in his amazing kindness. He had in view not only providing literal bread in Bethlehem for a Gentile woman or a Jewish mother-in-law, but the coming of the bread of life broken not only for Israel, but to provide salvation for men and women in every place. The fact that God went to such lengths to bring a Gentile woman into his purposes is surely an indication he would keep his covenant promises to bless, to, to Abraham, to bless the nations. It's fitting that the book of Ruth is traditionally read at the time of the Feast of Pentecost, the feast in the New Testament that believers would come to associate with the coronation of great David's greater son and the fulfillment of the father to his royal son. Psalm 2, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Now we just sung that hymn, God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. And the second verse, Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Here's a story that Sinclair Ferguson tells. Years ago, he says, during a visit to De Beers Diamond Mine in Kimberley, South Africa, I was taken down into the bowels of the earth, there to feel the shudder of the ground as miners blasted into the rock for diamonds. When we came up to the surface again and had been carefully searched, 
the manager of the mine said to us, you know, every day we blast away 16,000 tons of rock and we bring up only a couple of handful of diamonds. But it's worth it. It really is worth it for these priceless stones. Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. God had quarried deeply in them. And his purpose? He was mining for diamonds. And by the end of the book, all three know that it's been worth it. But even, even their joy then is only a foretaste of the joy of those who know God's amazing kindness in Jesus, their Savior and King. The story began for Naomi at a time when there was no king in Israel. It became a day when there was no bread in Bethlehem. And then a dark night in which there were no children in her family. Now, her covenant-keeping, all-sufficient God, Yahweh the Lord, had given her a grandson. And within a few generations, he would give Israel its greatest king. And a few generations further on, he would give the world its savior. Our God is not only the sovereign God, He's the God of amazing kindness, the God of covenant love and faithfulness, who can take a broken and empty woman and remake her life and fill her with joy, who can take a young woman from pagan Moab and incorporate her into his covenant people, who can take a wealthy landowner and give him a wife and family and a future way beyond anything he could imagine, who can transform a nation by raising up a king after his own heart, who can turn the world upside down by sending the Savior who has dealt with sin and opened the way to life for all who trust him. So, friends, take heart tonight. Take heart. This, this is our God, the Almighty, able to transform lives, even yours. The Sovereign Lord, at work in all things, yes, all things. The God of amazing kindness, steadfast love and faithfulness, who has come in Jesus as our Savior and Lord. What a wonderful God. And what a privilege, what a privilege to belong to him. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word and for this lovely little book of Ruth that teaches us so much about yourself. We praise you that you are the sovereign Lord working out your purposes in all that happens. We praise you that you're, you're the God of amazing kindness, the God who loves us with a never-failing love, the God who makes promises and keeps them, the God who has come in Jesus, a Savior. The God who can be trusted. Lord, when life is hard, when we make mistakes, when we feel empty, when things seem to go wrong, help us to remember these wonderful truths about you. And that even in the hard times, you are quarrying our lives, refining us so that we might not only come to know Jesus, but we might become like Jesus and point others to Jesus. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, we pray. In his name.